it's fascinating to me uh, how many China apologists there are, uh, again, despite all of the facts, despite uh, whatever religious preference anyone is on Wall Street, looking back at the Holocaust and what happened during World War II and Hitler with the Jews, and you know, never again should have had this asterisk by it. Said never again unless we think we can invest and make profits. Uh, then I guess we can just uh, live with some genocide and live with some uh, uh, what the atrocities that are going on that you and I have discussed over over the years uh, in Xinjiang and and uh, with the uh, the forced live organ harvesting of the Falun Gong and the Tibetans and the Mongolians and the ethnic Christians and they, everybody in China is persecuted if you're not Han Chinese and you know using using Xi thought um, you're you're a bad guy and they're going to cleanse you over time. But Wall Street just doesn't care about that, right? They they care about the next uh, profit dollar. So my personal experience is dealing with the institutional thought. From, from the board level of a, US, uh, a major U.S. endowment, as well as an individual level, an institutional level from my own firm, I see the schism and there's no answer to it. Uh, I don't know how it's fixed other than, thank God, the, Bi uh, the Biden administration um, uh, basically decided to renew new sanctions on a number of companies that are deemed to be uh, in engaged in the military civil fusion uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so thank God we did that. And now the question is, um, how many more of these companies can we, can we get on this? Because as we know, almost, uh, there's almost no company in China that doesn't have um, an obligation or linkage to the Communist Party. Well, no, exactly. So you talk, we talked about the civil military fusion a bit. And, you know, Often people in the West that are doing business with China imagine that it's working by the same set of rules, by essentially free market rules. You've already talked a little bit about how that's not the case. But so how, briefly tell me, how is it structured in there uh, in China? How, how does the Communist Party, where does it sit with respect to all these other structures? So, I mean, I think the best analogy is they, they sit at the, at the top of a Called the deity structure, right? The Xi Jinping is uh, is God and wants to be stronger than God in whatever re religion uh, one uh, professes to to believe in. And I think that that is it's clear, no matter who you are over there, uh, that that is that is the hierarchy. That's the feudal system uh, that that the Communist Party uh, sets forth. And I think that that. Um, that is so dangerous uh, in the long run uh, to have a, a, an entire civilization based on that hierarchy. And now she is emperor for life, right? This is uh, back to uh, almost uh, the, the Mao uh, ideology uh, of the reverence that people had for Mao who killed more people than Stalin and Hitler together, uh, right? So I worry that, that China's heading in a, in a direction that, that none of us really want. Uh, no, Nothing's getting better, John. I think everything seems to me that it's like like it's getting worse. Is there such thing as a independent private company in China? No, I don't. I don't believe so. I think everyone, every single citizen of China, has an obligation to uh, to the Communist Party and to to the president. And so I I don't believe there's any private company in China. So when did you first discover? Um, that there's something amiss here, and how did that happen? So back to the you know uh, back to the financial crisis in 2008. Um, I followed my my firm, uh, my, the people that work with me, and myself. We followed bad private assets to public balance sheets. So when companies like Fannie Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and and the banking system in the U.S. as we all know uh, was circling the drain due to its leverage and and the composition of its assets. Um, when the government stepped in to basically guarantee the bad assets on the bank's balance sheets and to expand the central bank's balance sheet and buy junk and buy everything that they bought, um, what that did was transfer the liability of the bad assets from private balance sheets to the public balance sheet. The U.S. could do it because it didn't have that many bad assets on its public balance sheet, on its sovereign balance sheet. But if you remember Europe, Europe doesn't have the same kind of central taxing authority 
and they have an experiment going on, but they don't have a system by which they are really truly united. It's all a bunch of individual countries with their own finance ministers. And so there were European countries like Iceland, like Ireland, right? Like Spain and Portugal who had these, um, they had a, more bad assets than the public balance sheets could take. So you saw Iceland fall almost immediately and Ireland fell and almost immediately and then Greece. They all had that, they had uh, the large uh, bad private assets ended up on their public balance sheets and it broke the public balance sheet, right? Because each of those countries didn't have its own central bank. You had the ECB and the ECB couldn't tell which child it loved the most essentially, right? So it had a real problem. Um, and so we followed those assets around the world and then every, every sovereign analysis that we looked at over time back then uh, always said X Japan, X Japan, X Japan, right? Because Japan blew the Gaussian distribution right out, right out of the water, you know. It wasn't a nice bell curve. It was everything but Japan because Japan's up and over here. They have so much on balance sheet debt. They have so many bad assets. They have zombie banks. So we studied Japan back in, um, call it 2009, 10 timeframe, 11 when Europe was collapsing uh, and the, had the Greek crisis in 2011. And then that took me to China and I was trying to understand how the Chinese financial system worked. I know their banking system was roughly three times levered to GDP. And to put things into perspective, the US financial system going into the financial crisis was about one times levered to GDP. And if you include Fannie and Freddie and all of the off balance sheet non-bank stuff, it was about 1.75 times levered. Um, Europe, Europe's banks in the worst cases were 10 times GDP. That was Ireland and Iceland. And then the rest were declining from there. So that's why they broke so quickly. Um, China was about three times GDP and they'd grown their credit system 50% of GDP a year every year for five years. So no one has lent that aggressively that quickly ever and not had a banking crisis. So we was trying to understand how China's financial system was put together both domestically and then how that system interfaces with the rest of the world internationally because they, have, they basically use dollars to interface with the rest of the world. I was trying to understand the origin of their dollars. And so it's a long answer to a, a simple question, but if you kind of take out a blank piece of paper and just try to understand the basic architecture of a system, it helps you understand um, the incentives of all the players and how the government operates and then how levered they are and then how much trouble they might be in if things go poorly. And uh, that's where I was about 10 years ago. So, and was there like a particular aha moment or something where you realized, oh my goodness, I've discovered something that I haven't seen before or yes. extremely unusual or? What, what was unusual is there was no uh, safety net for the Chinese banks, i.e. there was no FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, right? There wasn't a, if a bank went bad in theory, you could lose all your money as a depositor. Um, and so, you know, there are, call it four main SOE banks in China, state-owned enterprise banks. There are 12 joint stock banks and there's, you know, 10,000 local banks. And so I was trying to understand the relationships between their banks. The aha moment was this concept in China where the financial professionals at the banks were selling, um, they were selling these wealth management products. And the wealth management products were these highly levered investment vehicles and long-term assets in real estate, uh, both commercial and resi, uh, long-term uh, derivative products. And they had almost uh, um, a demand, they were almost demand deposits, i.e., you, you know, some wealth management products were one month, three months, nine months, a year. And the duration of their assets was, you know, call it five to 10 to 20 years sometimes. They were buying assets that, that had such long durations. There was a mismatch. If people ever wanted their money out, they couldn't sell all of those things, right? So that's what happened in the US in some of those structured investment products. Remember the SIVs that were famous for bringing down some of the balance sheets of the banks right away? That's essentially what an SIV is, right? It's an asset liability mismatch. So the wealth management products and the size of a wealth management products as a percentage of the Chinese banking system was an aha moment for me uh, because it was so big uh, in relation to where the US's SIVs were that um, I couldn't believe that they had actually allowed it to get that big as a percentage. But in the end, what I learned was the Chinese Communist Party 
can essentially control everything in its own banking system, right? It controls the narrative. It can handle, it can handle uh, any kind of propaganda. It can deliver any of the propaganda. It can, it can, uh, the Chinese Communist Party can give everyone uh, solace that they're going to back the banking assets of any bank and they can move on. So they can control the fires that, that end up burning in the banking system. As we saw with Baosheng Bank, and now we're seeing with uh, even Evergrande today, the Chinese uh, Communist Party is telling banks to stress their balance sheets for the lo one of the largest property companies in the world. Uh, it's a big deal. Um, it would be on the front page of every paper here, but for some reason people just believe that those things, that tree can fall in the woods and no one will hear it. So I, I've kind of tried to understand how it works within China, but what's more important is how China works with the rest of the world and how the dollars flow back and forth, and that, that relates to their rollout of the CBDC for next year.